Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining this tutorial again. My, uh, my name is Eson, this is Wild Becoming a Doctor Upper GI tutorial, and I'm going to hand it over to Daniel Hodder in a moment just to explain the health rules. If you have any questions or comments about what's currently on the screen, please put it in the chat. If you have any questions that can wait till the end, please put it in the question and answer box. Off to you, Dr. Hodder. Great, thank you very much, Eson. So welcome everyone. I know a few people are joining just as I'm speaking right now. Um, as mentioned, my name is Daniel. I'm a recent graduate from Imperial, um, about to start my F1 in August at St. Thomas's in London. Um, the topic of today's lecture is on upper GI, so basically covering everything from the esophagus down to duodenum. Um, I'll get into the structure of this evening's tutorial in a bit. A bit of an introduction though to begin with. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer, you've probably seen these in our previous tutorials. Obviously, don't take this information as medical fact. If you ever find yourself in a position where you are making decisions about patients, I imagine you would base it off guidelines, not off this PowerPoint. Um, but hopefully at the same time, this presentation will be very useful in helping you prepare for your exams. So, as we said, the structure of today's lecture, we're going to revise upper GI conditions by going through the three kind of common ways that they might present to a GP, to the hospital. Um, we'll get into what each of those mean. Um, I would be lying to you if I said we'd get this all wrapped up in an hour. There are quite a lot of conditions to get through. So I'll be honest, I'd say if we do it in an hour and a half, I think that would actually be quite long. So if we're lucky, probably looking around an hour and 15 minutes here. Obviously, if you want to jump off at any point, that's absolutely fine. Um, today's session is being recorded, but by the end of the next hour and 15 minutes, you will have revised about 80 to 90% of the upper GI that you might need for your exams. Um, if you watched my previous session a few weeks ago on difficult topics, um, you'll find that today's tutorial is quite similar. Um, I don't like just to read off slides. You'll find there's actually quite a lot of pictures on the slides instead. But don't worry about furiously copying down what I'm saying, because like we said, the session is being recorded. We will also be sent the slides afterwards and you'll find in the notes section pretty much everything that I say today. Um, in case you're not aware as well, all of the slides and presentations from the last three weeks are now available on Becoming a Doctor website. If you have a look there, you'll find that there is a sign up form and then you'll be able to access all of those. Um, today's session will focus on the most common conditions. Obviously, that makes up the bulk of your exam, but if you are very keen, if you're aiming for kind of distinctions, merits, you probably want to cover everything. This is not that kind of lecture today. I don't want to waste lots of time going through stuff that may or may not feature in your exam, but I will point out what those topics are, and then in the slides that you'll get after today's tutorial, you will find more information about those topics. A lot of SBAs, the setup is we'll do a few SBAs, we'll go over the info, and then we'll come back to the SBAs once we kind of understand and we're able to work through the answers. Um, just a quick note. So I've given this presentation for a few years now, originally for the Medical Education Society at Imperial or MedEd. Um, I mention them obviously because this is the original platform that they've given this tutorial through. Um, but just to point you towards them, even if you're not a student at Imperial. They're one of the largest peer-to-peer -peer support societies in the country. Do check out their website, do check out their Instagram. They've got loads and loads and loads of resources on there, all completely free. So do check them out. Okay, so the first presentation we're gonna look at is dyspepsia. Um, in plain English, it means general upper abdominal discomfort. Let's kick off with a few SBAs then. So have about a minute or so to read over this, and then I'll bring up our first poll. 
Okay, you've had about 45 seconds there, so I'll bring the poll up. You might want to make a note of your answer. Right, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's have a look at the results. So majority answer here is duodenal ulcer, which I believe is the correct answer. So well done to those of you who got that. Um, I normally give this tutorial a little bit earlier in the academic year. So some of these first few questions you might find fairly straightforward, but then as it goes on, you might find them a little bit trickier. Okay, so that was your first one. We'll do one more then, and then we'll crack on with some actual conditions. Here's your next one. Have a read through now. Right, 10 seconds. Right, get your answers in. Three, two, one. Right. And perfect. So vast majority of us going for an endoscopy. Good. That is the right answer here. Hopefully today's tutorial then might be a bit more of revision for a lot of you. And we'll try and kind of concisely go through the relevant conditions that you've just covered here and go through all the really key kind of facts that you'll need for your exams. OK, so we'll come back to those questions in a second. We're starting with dyspepsia. So you might be wondering, what does that actually mean? Like I said earlier, it means a general abdominal discomfort. It results in quite a few different symptoms. Obviously, patients may have one or several of these, but pain in the epigastric region, they get quite full early after a meal. They might burp, they might feel quite bloated or nauseous. And the idea is that these collection of symptoms would point a doctor towards some sort of upper GI issue. One of the most common differentials to think about then is an ulcer. So an ulcer literally means a break in the lining of the epithelium. So within vascular you might have covered arterial ulcers, venous ulcers. Again they're just breaks in the epithelium of your skin. The arterial or the venous just tells you why the break happened in the first place. Same sort of problem here. You've got a break in the lining of your stomach or your duodenum. And that kind of explains the symptoms that you'd get. As you break down that lining, eventually you'll get so far to the point at which you'll irritate nerves. And so you get pain. And that pain may stop you from eating. So like we said earlier, you'll get quite full quite quickly. It might make you nauseous and it might lead to anorexia. Not anorexia in the psychiatric sense, but anorexia in you stop eating purely because it's too painful. And obviously that then leads to some weight loss. In terms of the signs, there's not too much normally a patient presents with. Epigastric tenderness, okay, that makes sense. What is the pointing sign? What that means is if you ask the patient where is the pain, they can point exactly to where it is. That may not always be present, but that is classically what you associate with peptic ulcers. Um, and one other thing that ulcers can do is bleed. So obviously if that happens, eventually patients may get the signs of anemia. So they might be quite tired. They may have your kind of colonicia, your spoon-shaped nails. Um, you might get a flow murmur. Um, or if you think about blood loss, we'd have melina, they'd have an upper GI bleed. So there's quite a few ways that this might present. Now, the question that we looked at SBA1 focused on the difference between duodenal and gastric ulcers. So the vast majority of them are duodenal, about four and five. And 
if you are to look at textbooks, this is a really common SBA question you get. In reality, it's not really the case. But think about the gastric ulcer. The ulcer is in the stomach, and the second you eat, your stomach starts to produce more gastric acid to digest that food. So if you've got a break in the lining and you start exposing it to acid, you'll get pain. So it makes a lot of sense. Gastric ulcers, you start eating and you start to feel pain. What do people do? They stop eating because they don't want to feel that pain. Very logical. Duodenals are kind of the opposite of that then. So normally when you eat, the pylorus shuts at the end of the stomach. And that's to stop any acid getting into the duodenum. What that means then is when you eat food, duodenal ulcers classically will actually get better for a while because you shut off the pylorus. There's no acid getting to them. And then once the food's digested, the pylorus opens back up. And a couple of hours later, the pain comes back. That means classically patients would eat more because eating quells the pain. As I said, in reality, this purely kind of suggests one or the other. No doctor in their right mind would make a diagnosis based off this, but you'll see in a lot of past papers, you'll see in a lot of SBA books. So if we go to SBA1, we've got here a relatively young lady and she's got dyspepsia. So she's got some sort of epigastric pain. Looking at the differentials then, all of these are differentials for dyspepsia. Cholecystitis, okay, it might be slightly to the right, but often it can present with epigastric pain. But really, the clues are, well, if you look at the blood results and you want to type in the chat, what can you notice in the blood results? What do the blood results show? Yep, anemia. What kind of anemia? Good, microcytic. So looking at this question here, they've got a low hemoglobin, they have small red blood cells, so that points towards a microcytic, and it typically is indicative of iron deficiency anemia, or in other words, blood loss. So we've got some of epigastric pain, they're losing blood, so we're probably thinking ulcer, which narrows it down to C or D, as all of you managed to. But the answer ultimately is duodenal. Why? Because the pain comes, comes on after a few hours. Could it be gastric? Yes, it could. The only way really to know would be to do an endoscopy. But based off the information there, that's what we'd say is most likely. So that's SBA1. Let's keep going then. So now let's just understand a little bit more about why ulcers actually happen. In terms of the pathophysiology, your stomach is coated in this protective mucosa. Anything that damages the mucosa can eventually lead to an ulcer. And that's typically a lot of acid and anything that breaks down the protective lining there. We'll get into what those are. But also this diagram is quite nice because it helps you understand why patients get the symptoms they do. Like we said earlier, you break down the lining until eventually you hit a nerve and you get pain, or you hit a blood vessel and you get bleeding, or if you go far enough, you actually go all the way through the lining of the stomach and therefore you perforate. And that is a serious complication you can get of ulcers, perforated peptic ulcers. So what we're going to do now, like I said, I do quite like using pictures in presentations. We've got a quick picture around here. Using some of these clues in the chat, feel free to note down any risk factors you think are shown on the screen. So someone's saying H. pylori, good. That's the one in the top left. We'll get to H. pylori in a bit. Smoking, yep, smoking is a risk factor for a lot of things. And at the bottom then, yep, so these are meant to be in all person's hands. I know it's a little bit vague. Yes, probably the most common risk factor actually is age. Some people saying NSAIDs, that's definitely true. So things like aspirin and ibuprofen, if you take those regularly, then that will definitely up your risk. Um, as for the two that are left, these are a bit more niche. As I said, these are ones that you don't want to worry about too much. They're unlikely to feature in the test, but these are kind of your top level stuff. So someone's mentioned curling ulcers, perfect. So if you get burns, you can actually get a stomach ulcer after a burn. Very, very niche. I'll briefly talk about it a little bit later. And then the last one, a few of you said headaches. Now headaches have a link to ulcers, um, but that's probably because if you have a headache, you're likely to take painkillers and things like ibuprofen 
can, as we just said, up your risk. A few people have said stress. Yes, there is a bit of a link with stress. The one I'm actually going with there, I know the photo is a little bit vague. You'll find that if you have head trauma and you get a raised ICP, intracranial pressure, you can actually get what we call a Cushing ulcer. Again, if you've never heard of this, I'll briefly touch on it in a bit. But the head injury, the burns, those are the two quite minor ones. All of the others, they're much more important to think about. H. pylori, smoking, certain medications, and definitely age. So let's chat about those very briefly. NSAIDs, your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So those inhibit COX enzymes. And the reason that we give them to patients, just a quick revision of some of your preclinical stuff, because what we want to do is inhibit COX-2. You inhibit COX-2 and you reduce pain, you reduce inflammation. But the knock-on side effect is you inhibit COX-1. And why that's important here, COX-1 actually makes some prostaglandins and those prostaglandins protect the mucosa in your stomach. So we wanna be very careful of patients who take naproxen, take ibuprofen in the long term. Not only is it bad for your kidneys, but also bad for the stomach. So you might sometimes have to prescribe them alongside a PPI, so something like a meprazole. Anyone know who this is? I know this is a slightly strange question. It'd be weird if you recognize them from a photo, but if the topic is currently ulcers, that might be a bit of a clue. Any thoughts? So yes, this is a guy who discovered H, the link with H. pylori. Anyone know his name? Again, I think it'd be probably a bit weird if you did just from seeing his face. So this guy is called Barry Marshall. And if you rewind about 20 years ago, most doctors used to think that spicy food caused ulcers. So if you start getting an ulcer, the advice from your doctor was, stop eating spicy food for the rest of your life. And this doctor thought, okay, that's a bit silly. I'm not really sure that's true. He thought that there was a particular bacteria, H. pylori, that was leading to the ulcers. Now, he then approached an ethics committee and said what he wanted to do was infect lots of people with H. pylori and then check if they got ulcers or not. Obviously, that is ethically a little bit dubious, so he wasn't allowed. Anyone know what he did as a result? Yeah, he gave it to himself. And he ended, actually, ended up actually getting an ulcer and then he won a Nobel Prize. It's probably one of the weirdest ways that someone's ever won a Nobel Prize by giving themselves a stomach ulcer. Um, so are you gonna be testing that in your exam? No, but just remembering that kind of little bit of an interesting story, you get an idea behind kind of the link with H. pylori here. So you're probably thinking, well, why does H. pylori actually give you an ulcer? H. pylori itself has a particular enzyme in it, urease. So you think any enzymes ending in A's, they break down whatever is at the start. So they break down urea. And what they break the urea down into is ammonia. As you can imagine, ammonia is quite a harsh chemical. It's basically bleach. So what the bacteria do is they produce all of this bleach in your stomach and then the bleach ruins the mucosa, giving you an ulcer. In the Western world, it's one of the most common reasons for peptic ulcers. And that's why if someone presents with an ulcer, they're often going to be tested for H. pylori. So how do you test them? You've kind of got two choices here. You either use a breath test, and this is where you get people to breathe in urea or ingest it. And that urea is radioactively labeled. So you give them some 13 carbon urea and we'll take it in. And if H. pylori is present, the urease will do its job and it will turn the urea into ammonia. But the byproduct of that is CO2. So what's gonna to happen to the CO2? Any thoughts? Yeah, it's exhaled. So the CO2 itself, it's a gas. So it won't stay in the stomach. Actually, you'll just breathe it out. And that's how the test works. If you breathe out the CO2 and it's got that isotope in, it's got the 13 carbon in it, they'll run it through a mass spectrometer. And if it's there, it means you've got H. pylori. So that's briefly how the test works. It relies on that urease enzyme. 
The alternative is you look at their stool and you check if there's any antigens in the stool. How do you treat it? I'd say for your exams or if it ever turned up in a viva, triple therapy is your key phrase. That tells you, okay, there are three parts of the therapy. Firstly, a PPI, proton pump inhibitor, so a meprazole, lansoprazole, and then either clarithromycin with amoxicillin, so two antibiotics, but if they're allergic to penicillins, you give them metro. Yes, I'll include in the notes kind of things like the actual doses, etc. Is that likely to feature in an exam? To be honest, quite unlikely. That would be the stuff for kind of the top two, three percent. I wouldn't really bother, especially if you're in your early clinical years, spending time learning dosages, etc. Finally, it becomes a bit more important. But on the whole, okay, remember you've got a PPI and two antibiotics, and that should do the job. Just earlier, we mentioned some of your other differentials to think about. Um, so one that we haven't mentioned is something called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. And again, this is a bit more textbook. You're unlikely to see in real life. And this is where you have a gastronoma. So OMA, you've got a tumor, a benign tumor that secretes gastrin. What does gastrin do? It leads to more hydrochloric acid. What does PPI stand for? Proton pump inhibitor. So proton pump inhibitors are just one class of drugs you can use to treat gourd, you can use to treat ulcers. Examples, probably the most classical one would be omeprazole or lansoprazole. So those are your PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. Zollinger ellison syndrome then. So we said you've got this tumour that secretes gastrin. Gastrin ups the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And if you've got loads of hydrochloric acid, you'll end up with loads of ulcers. When should you think about Zollinger Ellison syndrome? In a patient who has an endoscopy and they discover hundreds of ulcers, that's one clue. Or a patient where you throw all of the treatment at them and they don't get better. It's also associated with MEN1, so multiple endocrine neoplasia. It's one of the tumors that you might get in that. But again, in the slides afterwards, I'll include more so you can think about it in a bit more depth. But today, it's not one of the more important things to know about. Cushing ulcers. So you think Cushing's syndrome, Cushing's disease, it's named after Harvey Cushing. So Harvey Cushing was a neurosurgeon. And that firstly helps you understand why Cushing's disease is Cushing's disease. Because if you've got an adenoma, the neurosurgeon is the one who's going to operate. Cushing's ulcers. So one thing he also noticed was patients who had head injuries and got a raised ICP, intracranial pressure, afterwards they end up getting an ulcer. Again, all you need to know is a couple of sentences. The theory behind it is that as the brain expands, it presses on the nucleus of the vagus nerve. And what the vagus nerve does is it secretes hydrochloric acid. So if you stimulate the vagus nerve because of that raised ICP, you get a lot of hydrochloric acid and you get an ulcer. Curling ulcers, a bit different. Those are ulcers that happen after some severe bed burns. And if you think about burns, one of the common complications is fluid loss. And if you lose a lot of fluid, then it's difficult for your stomach to protect itself because it's losing a lot of blood. So its mucosa gets damaged and you get an ulcer. Again, I'll include more slides on those, but those two sentences summaries for each, that should really be enough to see you through medical school, if I'm honest. Now, what do you do about peptic ulcer disease? That's what the second question looked at. I'd say overall, and this will apply to a lot of the conditions that we look at this evening, divide it into are there red flags or are there no red flags? If the patient is young, so the cutoff year normally is 55, if they're under 55, they've got no weight loss, they've had no fevers, they have not lost their appetite, there's no suggestions that they might be anemic. If that's the case, then you're probably thinking as the GP, this is an ulcer. So you'll arrange either for the stool antigen or the breath test. You might do some of the others. So you might check if they're anemic. You might look at their gastrin if you're subject thinking about Zollinger Ellison, but like I said, probably not. Whereas if they're over 55, they've got those red flag symptoms, or the treatment so far has not worked, then you might send them off for an endoscopy. And what will they do with the endoscopy? They'll probably take a biopsy of the ulcer. And what they can do there is urease testing. So that's another way to look for H. pylori. You check if there's urease in the biopsy. 
You then treat the patient, send them away, and then bring them back in about six weeks to do another endoscopy just to check that things have resolved. So broadly speaking, that's how you want to approach a peptic ulcer question when it comes to investigations. How do you then treat peptic ulcers? So think about kind of structures in your questions, especially, okay, I know this year there aren't really any practical exams, but eventually when that all starts up again and you get viva questions, in a viva question, you always wanna have a structure. So when it comes to management, the structure we always go for is conservative medical surgical. So starting with a conservative, the main thing you do here is you monitor their risk factors. If they smoke, advise them to stop smoking. NSAIDs, ideally, if they're taking NSAIDs in the long term, you're going to need to give them a PPI at the same time. Or you might suggest that they use an alternative like paracetamol. Bisphosphonates, that's one that we didn't mention. So if you think about osteoporosis, most commonly for osteoporosis, you give a bisphosphonate, you give alendronic acid or alendronate. That medication can really irritate your esophagus and give you esophagitis and can lead to ulcers. So for those patients, we advise that they take it on an empty stomach and they take it standing up. But if this is a complication, we might then think about changing them onto a different medication. Now, what about the prescription options. So we said if it's H. pylori, you give them the triple therapy, so you give them the PPI and the two antibiotics. If they're H. pylori negative, you just give them the PPI, the omeprazole. If they can't tolerate that, or if it doesn't work, then normally second line, we might move to an H2 antagonist. So that would be something like ranitidine. Yes, if they're anemic, then you might need to give them some ferrous sulfate, you might need to actually bring the iron levels back up. What can go wrong? We kind of already mentioned this, they can bleed. And in the long term, that will make you anemic. But if it bleeds acutely, then they might actually vomit this up. So later on, we'll get into hematemesis. This is a differential for hematemesis, a bleeding peptic ulcer. And if, the, if it bleeds, what you do, you go in and you stop the bleeding. So you do an endoscopy. And what you can do is inject the ulcer with adrenaline. The adrenaline leads to vasoconstriction. And if you constrict the arteries around it, you stop the bleeding. What was the virus structure I mentioned? So if you ever asked about management, try and break it down into conservative, then medical, then surgical. As for perforation then, so we said if, if the ulcer goes all the way through, it'll per perforate. Generally, if anything perforates, esophagus, stomach, intestines, the patient will be very, very sick. So they'll probably be hemodynamically unstable, so you'll probably need to resuscitate them, but you'll give them antibiotics because if something's perforated, then all of this nasty bacteria is going to get into the peritoneum, and probably you're going to need to operate. So in the comments then in the chat section, anyone know what this x-ray is showing? pneumoperitoneum, basically air in the peritoneum or air under the diaphragm. So we can see under the diaphragm here, this black area that should not be there, it should normally be completely opaque around the diaphragm. And that means there's some air in the peritoneum, which means that something in the GI tract has perforated. So that's why often when patients come in to A&E, they'll get an erect chest x-ray, especially if they've got any abdominal pain, because this is one thing that we want to rule out. We want to rule out any perforations, especially if they're very sick. One of the other reasons that we worry about ulcers, though, is that if you don't treat an ulcer, ultimately it can develop into cancer. Imagine what's going on. You've got all of these horrible irritants on the cells. They're not going to respond well to that. And eventually they're going to mutate. They mutate, they form cancer. So looking at the symptoms of gastric cancer, it's very, very similar, almost identical to an ulcer. And this also helps you understand the, the investigations a bit. So remember what we said, the main things when it comes to investigation is age, your red flags, and previous treatment. Because if there's a red flag there, you as the doctor, just based off the patient's history, you don't know, is this an ulcer or is this cancer? And that's why you need to do the endoscopy. Because if you do the endoscopy, then you can biopsy and then you can check. So overlaps very much from a symptom perspective, but that's why we're doing this biopsy.
risk factors very much the same but the idea is if you leave it for a long time without treatment and there are some kind of very textbook signs that gastric cancer can present with in the chat feel free to comment what you think these are so anyone know the names for them or what they are yeah so the top the one at the top right is verco's node so that is you can see this lymph node here in the left supraclavicular fossa and then yes the other one well done is a sister mary joseph node and this is actually metastasis in your belly button in the umbilicus now you see these in textbooks a lot especially older ones why is that go back 20 30 years before endoscopy became really popular back then we wouldn't spot gastric cancer it would get really bad it would metastasize and people would present with this sort of stuff you can see that that looks horrible nowadays you rarely see these kind of signs so even though you read about them a lot in a textbook most patients now get spotted early by endoscopy perhaps not early in an oncology perspective but a lot earlier than they used to and therefore okay that you won't often see a lot of patients go on and get these very kind of nasty metastases and signs how do you investigate as we send you to an endoscopy and then you take a biopsy because that will allow you not only to do cytology to grade the cancer but we'll also help with the histology part grading the cancer as well sorry staging the cancer so back to sba2 and a lot of this got this one right perfect it is an endoscopy why is that well they're over 55 they're able to point to the pain on their abdomen so that's that pointing sign that we talked about so this could be an ulcer but they've been losing weight and therefore they've got a red flag so regardless of the red flag because they're 61 you have to send them for an endoscopy that's how the nice guidelines work and when it comes to exam technique the clue is also which of these is the most important so always look for those kind of phrases some questions will ask which of these is the best initial investigation and that's often okay well which of these is the least invasive which one should i do first most important how you can often look at that is if i don't do this which one will probably lead to the greatest harm all of the others if you don't do them you, you still probably even if you do get them you won't get the diagnosis but the idea with the endoscopy is if you don't do the endoscopy you could miss this gastric cancer so that's why you need to do it right those were your first two sbas i've been talking for a while now so let's give you your next one have a read through now make a note of your answer and then we'll bring up your poll okay get your answers in three two one okay good set of results majority of us getting it right yes you do want to give them a proton pump inhibitor the ppi why is that well this lady probably has gourd and that's generally how you'd start investigating gourd but again we'll come back to this one in a bit we'll give you one more then why the cough i'll explain the cough when we get back to it don't worry so have a read through not give you as long for this one it's a bit shorter so let's bring up your pool this question is mainly kind of just factual recall if you know what that indicates you'll get this one right if you don't it'll be a bit of a guess so get your answers in <laughs> 
three, two, one. Okay, so like I said, if you knew that Barrett's esophagus was metaplasia, you get it. If you don't know Barrett's esophagus is metaplasia, then it's a bit of a guess. But don't worry, we'll go through what Barrett's is and then we'll come back to the question. Still reassuring to see a lot of us getting it right. Okay, so condition that we're now going to start off with is GERD. In America, they call it GERD because they spell esophagus with an E, but the acronym then is gastroesophageal reflux disease, and the name tells you exactly what it does. The stomach refluxes up into the esophagus. And if you know that, then you can figure all of the symptoms out based off of this. So as the gastric acid travels back up the esophagus, you get a feeling of heartburn, a feeling of regurgitation. So what that means is you can feel the stomach contents coming back up into your mouth or the food that you've just eaten coming back up into the mouth. And a lot of patients will also report some problems with dysphagia because as the food's going down, the gastric acid is coming back up. And we refer to those as kind of the classical symptoms of gorge. Those are the ones that traditionally in textbooks you'd think about. Obviously, in reality, not every patient is like a textbook. So below that are what we'd call your atypical symptoms. So these are other ways in which a patient might present. So in the chat, one of you asked about, well, why did the patient have a cough? So as that gastric acid comes up, and once it gets up far enough into the esophagus, what you might actually find is then it goes back down via the trachea. Goes down by the trachea, irritates the airways, and that makes you cough. Or as it goes up the esophagus, it will irritate the vocal cords, giving a bit of hoarse voice. Or one other way it might present, and this is really important, especially in an emergency setting, as the stomach acid kind of fills up and pushes on the stomach, the stomach is next to the heart, it will push on the heart, giving you chest pain. So a common differential to think about when a patient comes to A&E with chest pain is gourd. It's a very, very common differential. A lot of people will come thinking they're having a heart attack when in fact they've got a bit of reflux. Finally, if that gastric acid gets far enough up the esophagus, it may get to the teeth. And because it's acid, what will it do to the teeth? It will erode the teeth. Why do people get gourd? So like I said earlier, when you're in a viva, you want to classify your answers. So I've tried to do this here a little bit with the risk factors. The diagram is one way to think about it firstly. You've got the stomach here, and in order for the, the stomach acid to go back up, there are three ways that might happen. Number one, there is something outside of the stomach pushing on it. So that's anything that ups the intra-abdominal pressure. So obesity, there's a lot of fat around the stomach, pressing on the stomach, or pregnancy, there's a baby. Second thing then, the lower esophageal sphincter, so the sphincter at the bottom of the esophagus, that is normally closed. So in its normal state, that's normally closed because you don't want gastric acid going up the esophagus. Esophagus is not designed for that. But if anything leads to hypotension in that sphincter, basically it's more loose than it should be, that will allow more gastric acid up there. So what sort of stuff might that be? So certain drugs will relax the muscle surrounding the sphincter. So calcium channel blocks it, block, blockers, Smoking also does this as well. Achalasia we'll get to at the end of today's tutorial. I think about achalasia as kind of reverse gourd. So the gourd, the lower soft shield sphincter is too tight. Achalasia, it is not tight enough and therefore food can't get down. So the way that you treat achalasia is normally you, you one treatment is that you can inject Botox into this area. Botox will make it tighten up, but if it gets, sorry, will make it loosen up. And if it gets too loose, then you'll get gourd. Hiatus hernia, I'll speak about that a little bit later. That's a condition in itself. And then finally, okay, so we've said two things already. You've either got stuff pushing on the outside, you've got the sphincter too loose, or you actually have too much acid in the stomach. And that might be because of certain foods. I can't tell you which ones, I'm not sure myself. If you've ever had gourd yourself, you probably have noticed that certain foods will set it off. Smoking, just like peptic ulcers, bad for your stomach. And then also Zollinger Ellison we spoke about earlier, that's where you secrete lots of gastrin. So what's a hiatus hernia? Well, 
a hernia, if you're ever on a surgery placement, a really common question from any surgeon is define a hernia. I've been asked that probably 10 times during medical school. So a hernia is a protrusion of a viscous through its containing wall. Now, to most of you, that probably doesn't mean anything at all. To put that in simpler terms, a hernia is where you have some part of the body that should be contained within another part of the body. So the example here is, the stomach should be contained under the diaphragm. But where, with a hernia, what happens is it then protrudes, it sticks through that wall, it goes beyond it, it pushes out of the wall that would normally contain it. Same idea here. The stomach should be underneath the diaphragm, but a hiatus hernia is where the stomach actually herniates through the diaphragm. And so you can see on this diagram at the bottom, you can see your stomach herniating through the top. It's pushing through. And why is it called a hiatus? Because this is the diaphragmatic hiatus. It's where your esophagus meets the diaphragm. What was the definition again? So I can write it at the bottom for you here. Um, so a hernia is protrusion of a viscous through its containing walls. There you go. Um, as a definition, once you know it and you understand it, it's fine, but the first few times you see it, you probably think, well, what does that mean? Why is that relevant now then? So hiatus hernia can lead to gorge. Most often it's discovered incidentally. You might have a chest X-ray, you might have pneumonia, and then they look and they can see that part of the stomach is protruding through the diaphragm. But because of this, it allows gastric acid to reflux more easily. So just keep in mind that this is one particular risk factor that you might get. How do you investigate it? Well, you can get patients who are barium swallow. So they swallow barium and they take an x-ray. And this is what you might get. You can see that diagram in the bottom left. Ah, can't see the definition. Don't know why it's not turning up. I just posted it there. Hopefully that turns up now. Um, if not, I'll post at the end, don't worry. So bottom left, you can see a barium swallow. They've given someone a barium meal, they've swallowed it, and they've taken the x-ray, and you can see where you should kind of have the diaphragm here. It's protruding through. Everything in white should be underneath the diaphragm. But you might also see it on endoscopy, you might see it instantly on a chest x-ray. How do you manage it? It'll be very similar to the management for gourd that we'll get into in a second. Basically monitor risk factors or modify them. So what does that mean? Things like lose weight, or if you smoke, stop smoking. Give them a PPI to reduce the acid, that will help. Or if none of that works, ultimately you might give them an operation. A particular operation here is called Nissen van Doplication. I cannot tell you the details of how the operation works. I'm not a surgeon. All I really say you need to know is the name. And that's about it. How do you investigate gourd then? So really similar to what we just said earlier about peptic ulcers. Are there risk factors or not? Is the patient over 55? So if we take your low risk patient, the patient who's under 55, who doesn't have weight loss, who is not anemic or has any signs of anemia, you as probably the GP are thinking this is gourd. So what do you do? You give them a PPI. You give them something like a meprazole. And not only is this a treatment, but it's also an investigation at the same time. Because if it works, if their chest pain gets better or their regurgitation settles, then you are probably right. They probably did have gourd. So we'd say that trialing them on this PPI, it's both diagnostic, because if it works, it means it probably was gourd, but it's also therapeutic as well. It actually treats them. And for a lot of patients, that will be it. You give them the PPI for however long they need, several months, several years, and things settle. Obviously then if they've got risk factors, if they have some red flags, they're losing weight, they're very tired, they're showing signs of blood loss, like Melina. Now you're thinking, okay, this is a, a bit worse. We are a bit more cautious, so we send them off for an endoscopy. Or if you try them on the PPI and the PPI didn't help, 
they tr fail the treatment, you send them for endoscopy as well. What will they do with endoscopy? They'll take a biopsy and they'll check out what's going on. So going back to our earlier SBA, so we've got this, based off the guidance, young lady, she's under 55, she's got heartburn, it gets worse at night. Why a lot of patients it get worse, gets worse at night. If you imagine kind of lying down to go to sleep, instead of gravity keeping the stomach acid in your stomach, you lie down and the stomach acid comes back up your esophagus. So a lot of patients will say it's worse when they lie down. The funny taste in her mouth, that's basically the regurgitation. She can taste the stomach acid, but systemically she's well. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna give her a PPI. Hopefully that works. If it does, end of story. If it doesn't, then she'll go for an endoscopy. How do you manage gourd? Again, it's quite similar to what we said earlier. Treat them conservatively. So ask them to lose, try and lose weight. They might want to have a few pillows to stop the stomach acid coming back up and stop smoking or consider any drugs such as calcium channel blockers that might be making it worse. Medications wise, you're going to probably give them a PPI, a meprazole. If that doesn't work, you might give them something like ranitidine. What's a PPI? Proton pump inhibitor. So it's just the name of the drug class. Within that drug class, you have a meprazole, lansoprazole, anything ending in azole. Surgery wise, we mentioned that one earlier, Nissenfund duplication, or there's another one, I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but basically for the patients who fail all of these options, Right at the end, surgery is an option to consider, but that's kind of your final stage. Why do we worry about gourd then? As we said earlier, with ulcers, over time, if you have an ulcer, it can mutate, it can become cancer. Same kind of concern here. If you have acid refluxing into the esophagus, that acid doesn't belong in the esophagus. The esophagus is not designed to hold acid in it all the time. So what, the, what actually happens is the esophagus adapts and it changes from a squamous epithelium, so squamous is the sort of stuff that you've got on your skin, to a columnar epithelium. And columnar is the sort of stuff that you'd have in your stomach. Why is that? Well, the esophagus has all of this acid around it. So basically the cells think, okay, it will change into columnar cells because columnar cells can cope better with the acid. And that's what we call metaplasia. So metaplasia is where you go from one cell type to another. But eventually, if that goes on and on and on, it can lead to dysplasia, where you start to get carcinogenic mutations, and you'll actually end up getting esophageal cancer. So that's why we worry about gourd, because if you don't do anything about gourd, it's quite a big risk factor for getting esophageal cancer. So the question earlier was about Barrett's. What is Barrett's? We've just said. Metaplasia of the esophagus. Because you've got this chronic esophagitis, the esophagus is inflamed because of all the acid. You change from squamous epithelium to columnar. And that by itself is not awful. It's not too worrying. But as time goes by, we said you've got this risk of dysplasia. What will you see on endoscopy? You can see at the bottom right here that you've got these kind of tongues of mucosa. So you can see the parts that are, I can't, to be honest, I'm not a gastroenterologist. I can't tell you which ones are squamous, which ones are columnar. Probably the squamous is the lighter colored one, if I'm honest, taking an educated guess. But you can see that you've got these kind of tongues of one type and tongues of the other type. So when you hear about metaplasia in the esophagus, that's what Barrett's esophagus is. It's just the eponymous name for it. How do you manage it? It depends on the type of metaplasia you've got or dysplasia. If it's just one single nodule, pretty easy, cut it out. If it's widespread, then you'll have to ablate it using radio frequency waves. But regardless of its type, you're gonna give them a PPI. And why is that? Well, it's like treating the gourd. You want to stop the process that led to it in the first place. If there's chronic esophagitis, if there's lots of gastric acid, you wanna bring the gastric acid down because you don't want this to come back. But if you don't treat it, or if it doesn't respond well, eventually you might get a soft gel cancer. It's about eighth or ninth in terms of most common cancers in the UK, but it has one of the worst outcomes because by the time people spot it, it's often quite late stage. How does it normally present? 
difficulty swallowing. We'll get into that symptom after this section. But because it's a cancer, as it grows, at first people might struggle to swallow solids because you imagine the esophagus is getting a bit thinner because something's growing inside of it. And then solids can't get down, but liquids can. But over time, as it gets bigger and bigger, eventually liquids get stuck as well. But you've also got your red flags. So if you're thinking about taking a history, it's what people often call kind of flaws, fatigue, weight loss, appetite, lethargy, etc. that sort of stuff. Um, and there are two main types, adenocarcinomas, that's the most common type in the UK. And why do you get that? Barrett's. So that diagram I just gave you earlier of Gord Barrett's, that gives you adenocarcinoma. And why is this? Well, it go, again, I don't want to go into too much histopathology, but adenocarcinomas mean you've got a malignant cancer of your mucin secreting cells, of glands. And you think about columnar epithelium, columnar is like a gland. So you're going to get adenocarcinoma. Whereas if you're more at the top of the esophagus, it's going to be more squamous. And we don't get that much here. You see it in places more like China or Iran, because a big risk factor is nitrosamines or nitrosamines. There is a certain type of food substance that you find in a lot of Chinese and Iranian food, um, but also smoking alcohol. What are you going to do in terms of your investigations? You're going to do an endoscopy and biopsy it so that you can grade and stage it. But you're probably going to have to do a CT to stage it to see how far it spread. So as we just said, this diagram on the left from cancer research is for the UK. You'll see that the vast majority of cancers in the UK is, for esophagus is adenocarcinoma. So that's most likely to feature in your exam. And it makes a lot of sense because this is closest to the stomach, the bottom of the esophagus will get exposed to the most hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid is the carcinogen in this example. So back to SBA4. They've got this pain here, which is pointing towards a history of gourd. And the fact that they've got metaplastic change, that is synonymous with Barrett's. If you've got metaplasia in the esophagus, that's Barrett's. So this is a quick summary of dyspepsia. We've gone through all of the differentials, peptic ulcer, cancers, gourd, esophageal cancer. We did say earlier that biliary issues can give you dyspepsia. And then the bottom one on the list, non-ulcer dyspepsia, what is that? Basically, if you've tried to investigate the patient and you've looked for all of the others, but you didn't find them, then that's probably the diagnosis that you'll settle on. It's a diagnosis of exclusion, only once you've excluded the rest. As for investigations, we talked about, okay, are they above or below 55? And do they have red flags or not? So that was dyspepsia. Let's now take a look at dysphagia. So I'll give you another question to have a look through. So have a read through of this one. Okay, let's bring up your poll. Off you go. Three, two, one. Okay, let's have a look. Majority opinion is achalasia and good achalasia is the right answer. But like earlier, we'll come back to this. Don't worry for now. We'll do one more then, and then we'll jump back into the conditions. So have a read through. Someone's asking, how do you define dysphagia? Dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. 
Okay, let's bring up your next poll. Three, two, one. Okay. People weren't as certain with this one, but still the majority getting it right. Perfect. It is esophageal cancer. Um, we did go over that condition very briefly just now, but you can see that you've got this older patient with some red flag symptoms. They've got some weight loss, difficulty swallowing, the suggestion that they're bleeding as well. I can see why a few of you said Plumber Vincent as a result. If you've never heard of Plummer Vincent, I'll talk about it in a bit. But let's now talk about dysphagia. Ruff, so dysphagia then, I'll be honest with you, the best resource I know of for covering this topic is the Oxford Cases in Medicine and Surgery. Some of you might have read it before. It's, it's a red book. You can find it online. You might be able to find a PDF. Um, but it's a red book, Oxford Cases in Medicine and Surgery. If there's any book I'd say to read during your clinical years of medical school, it's that one. It's really nicely laid out based off presenting complaints. And the dysphagia section in particular is amazing. So I made a note of it in the comments. I probably could not do that section justice. I could not do any better than that chapter of the book could. But I'll try and pick out really the key things just to summarize it right now. So. If we think about dysphagia, you firstly want to classify it. And how do you do that? You can firstly start with, well, where is the dysphagia happening? Where are they having a problem with swallowing? If it is at the top, that often points towards a neurological cause. Or if it's at the bottom, then there are a few other courses to consider. In reality, if you ask a patient, where does the food get stuck? It's not very reliable, but that's just a start. So if a patient says, I'm having problems swallowing, you might wanna ask them, okay, once you start eating, how many seconds afterwards do you start to notice a problem? If it's very early on, then it's probably gonna be stuff on the top row. If it's after 30 seconds, then it might be the stuff on the bottom row. So that's one way. Then the second way, is, is this a functional problem or a structural problem? So a structural problem means there is something blocking the path. There's something in the esophagus, in the wall, on the outside of the wall. And that could be something cancerous, it could be a foreign body. How will that present? Well, remember we said earlier about esophageal cancer, you get a problem with solids first, then liquids. Because at the start, liquids can still get past that blockage, but as it gets bigger and bigger, eventually no liquids. Whereas a functional problem means there's an issue either with the nerves or the muscles involved in the process. And that might be because you've had a stroke, you might have Parkinson's, myasthenia, you've got an issue with the muscles themselves in the esophagus, or achalasia. I briefly mentioned that about 20 minutes ago, we'll get into achalasia because that's quite a common differential to think about, but that's just a bit of a starter. So think about where is the dysphagia happening? And okay, is it structural? Is there something in the way? So they're gonna have solids, then liquids. Whereas if it's functional, you'll find that actually it's both at the same time. If they don't start with solids, they start with solids and liquids. So achalasia, what is that? It's hard to define achalasia because I would probably start with the pathophysiology. So we said earlier, it's, it's a bit like a reverse gourd. So with gourd, the lower esophageal sphincter is too loose and all the gastric acid comes up. This time it is too tight. And instead of the gastric acid being the problem, the issue now is because it's so tight, food can't get through. And if food can't get through, you have problems swallowing. So there's an issue there with the lower esophageal sphincter, the nerves surrounding it don't work properly. But also as a result, you don't get any peristalsis, you don't get any muscle contraction in the smooth muscle of the esophagus. And the two combined mean that the patients have problem swallowing. So how will it present? Dysphagia, but as we just said, commonly it will be solids and liquids at the same time. 
because if the solids can't get through, the liquids can't get through either. So they might bring the food up, regurgitate it. And if they're not eating, they might get weight loss. Weight loss, not because they have a malignancy, but weight loss just because they're not eating. So that's how I think about it personally. I think about it as reverse gorge. Instead of the gastric acid coming up, the food can't get down. But regardless of that, if a patient presents with dysphagia, what is the thing that you're probably most worried about? We've already mentioned it. You can post in the chat. Yeah, esophageal cancer. So in any patient presenting with dysphagia, but especially if they're older, the most important differential for you to rule out is esophageal cancer. So if you actually look at the NICE referral pathways, dysphagia in any patient is considered enough to refer on to secondary care. But especially if they're over 55, in your view, there should be cancer until evidence proves otherwise. So all the time dysphagia, our biggest concern is esophageal cancer. How do you investigate dysphagia? There's a few different ways to go about this. And some of these investigations you don't really hear about in other areas of medicine. So one of them is a barium swallow. We've mentioned that already. They swallow some barium, you take some images. What's the purpose of that? It will help show where the issue is happening because you can visibly see where the swallowing is going wrong. And you can use it for achalasia, and achalasia has a very characteristic appearance, which I'll show you in a second. But also if it's quite high up, so one differential is a pharyngeal pouch. So you have an outpouching of your pharynx and food gets stuck in there. You need to do dysphagia if it's high up to look for this, because if you don't identify it and you go for an endoscopy, you might actually perforate that um, pouch. So that's why you might also use barium swallow. We've talked about endoscopy. If you're worried, that's often your first line investigation. Video fluoroscopy is a bit like a barium swallow, but the idea is instead of an image, you get an actual video. Useful for salt and your kind of speech and language therapists because they can actually themselves watch the image and figure out exactly what the problem is and then coach the patient on how to fix the issue. Finally, manometry. You think anything that ends in meter means to measure. What manometry does is it actually measures um, the esophageal sphincter to check if it's too tight or too loose. Now, if you've ever seen It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, you may have seen this before. If not, you're probably very confused. The topic is achalasia. So anyone know why I've given you this very weird image here? Yeah. So if you've seen this episode, this will be, this make a lot more sense. But when you do that barium swallow, what you get is a bird's beak appearance. And if you see this in an exam, you immediately think achalasia. So you can see the barium in white, it's coming down the esophagus and it kind of tapers in at the sphincter because it's too tight and it doesn't let any of the barium through or just a tiny little bit trickles through. So you get that idea of a bird's beak. Now, contrasting that with esophageal cancer, how do you decide which one the answer is in a question? This diagram hopefully summarizes the key things, but the two are kind of opposites of one another. Esophageal cancer, we're thinking, okay, in an old patient with red flags, and there is a structural issue, so you start with solids, then liquids, so you send them for an endoscopy. Whereas achalasia, someone young, where the issue has been going on for a while. And keep in mind, it doesn't always happen. With achalasia, it may happen one day and then the next day they're fine. It's all about whether the lower soft field sphincter can relax or not. And some days it may work, some days it may not. But they don't really have any red flags, maybe some mild weight loss. But from an investigation perspective, you want to do that barium swallow so you can see the bird's beak. And you might also do manometry as well to measure how tight it is. So esophageal cancer and achalasia are probably the two most common ones to have in your head, especially when it comes to upper GI. But why dysphagia is difficult, there are lots of other differentials and they cover loads of medicine. So one area, firstly, are neurological causes. 
we just said earlier that often neurological causes are a bit higher up. And the clues in a question is the patient may end up coughing or choking. And the idea is there's an issue with the actual swallowing process. So forming a bolus of food and then the food going down the esophagus, that's where the issue lies. And say if it's a stroke, the muscles that are supplied by the brain, that area of the brain, that's where the stroke is. Or motor neuron disease, that's one to think about. Sometimes that presents with dysphagia. Some clues there, if you do a cranial nerve exam, then you might get a bulbar palsy. What does that mean? It means a weakness in the bulbar cranial nerves. So issues with a cough, issues with swallowing, and actually they get a bit of a change in the tone of their voice as well. Again, that is a little bit textbook, not the most important thing to take away from today. Is achalasia congenital, someone's asked? To be honest, I don't know. I think the pathophysiology is not as clear as some of the other conditions that we've looked at, but I think that might be an interesting thing to look into. I can't tell you if it is or not. If someone does know, feel free to post in the chat. A couple other ones to go through then. So what is plumber Vincent syndrome? Um, much, much rarer, but you see it in textbooks all the time because it makes a really good exam question. plumber Vincent syndrome is kind of a triad of soft gel webs. Why do I say triad? Well, two things mainly. Soft gel webs, which you can see on this endoscopy here. And because they've got these soft gel webs, food gets stuck. So they get dysphagia. So that's why it's a differential dysphagia. They've got these webs in the way. But also they get iron deficiency anemia. Not too sure of the exact mechanism behind it, but when you see a patient who has dysphagia and they've got iron deficiency, iron deficiency anemia, it is one thing to consider. Obviously, the other conditions are a lot more common, but it is one to kind of have at the back of your head, especially if you rule out the other causes. And if you see esophageal webs, that's pretty much going to be Plummer Vincent syndrome. Pharyngeal pouch, we talked about that earlier, it's where the pharynx has an outpouching. So there's an area of the pharynx that's quite weak, and then when you put it under pressure, it expands. The typical clue here in an SBA is often halitosis, bad breath, because the food gets stuck in their pouch, it decomposes, and then when they breathe out, it lets out a very bad smell. Pretty nasty. But you can see this other barium swallow, and you can see that this is very, very high up. You can kind of see the vertebra, you can see the base of the skull, and just around here, the pharyngeal pouch is full up with the barium. Two more then, esophageal spasm. So this is where the muscles themselves spasm. And I mean, it's in the name. What does that give you? So the typical thing you'll see on this barium swallow or in an exam question is the phrase, a corkscrew esophagus. So the esophagus randomly spasms, the muscles for some reason, I can't tell you why, spasm, and then you get this corkscrew appearance. So if you see corkscrew esophagus, esophageal spasm is 99% the answer. We've also got Crest syndrome. So now we're getting into a bit of rheumatology. Like I said, there's loads of different conditions under this heading. So it used to be called Crest, now we call it scleroderma. So scleroderma literally means kind of tight, hard skin, because that's one of the ways it presents. But it's an autoimmune condition. And Crest is just a good way to kind of remember um, the different things that it will present with. So this diagram kind of tells you them, but the E, stands for soft gel dysfunction. Obviously this is American, we put an O at the front, but it's a bit like good. So the E stands for soft gel dysfunction. So often if you see a patient who's got symptoms of dysphagia, but you notice some signs on their hands, or you notice some dilated blood vessels, um, or you notice they've got some calcinosis, so they've got the buildup of calcium, then you wanna think about Crest. Someone's asked, why does limited cutaneous scleroderma cause esophageal symptoms? Um, I'll come back to that one. We're going off on a little bit of a tangent. Try and post that, just copy and paste that into the Q&A, and I'll come back to that one at the end, just so that we get through everything first. Okay, so going back to our SBAs, this question, was achalasia, why? Well, think through that diagram I gave you earlier, comparing esophageal cancer and achalasia. We've got someone here who is young, that already is pointing towards achalasia over some of the others. Two years, so it's been going on for quite a while. If you had an esophageal cancer going on for two years, you'd probably be dead by that point, to put it lightly. 
but it's starting with solids and liquids. So this is suggesting it's a functional issue, not structural. No systemic symptoms. The heartburn and the cough, that is probably because the food is coming back up. And that's what's giving them the feeling of heartburn or what the patient thinks is heartburn, but it's just dysphagia. We sometimes also use the phrase adonophagia as well. Adonophagia means a painful swallow. Then on top of that, the nocturnal cough, well, if some of the food is going up, it might then go back down via the trachea and then you're coughing to get rid of it. Would you always do a barium swallow before an OGD? Um, personally, I don't know. If you're suspecting a pharyngeal pouch, you definitely have to do a barium swallow first. Um, that is maybe one thing that we should check at the end. Um, do you do it on everyone? Pharyngeal pouch, yes. But if you don't suspect a pharyngeal pouch, I'm not too sure. Let's have a look at that a bit later. So our first one was achalasia because they've got no risk factors for cancer. They're much too young to be having a stroke. No suggestions that they have an iron deficiency anemia. So nothing to point towards the others. Next SBA. Now this is the polar opposite. We've got someone who's much, much older. That it started with solids and then it became liquids. They don't have the kind of coughing or heartburn symptoms that the previous patient did. And the loose brown black stools is pointing towards melina. So we're probably thinking now, okay, there's something bad going on. The microcytic anemia. So I know why a few went for Plummer Vincent there. But why is it esophageal cancer? Plummer Vincent is much less common. So out of the two, it's probably going to be esophageal cancer. And the fact that it's getting worse, you think about Plummer Vincent, you've got these webs. If the webs are there, the webs may grow slightly, but the fact that this is randomly shown up in a 76 year old, so they've managed to get to that age, Plummer Vincent is probably a lot less likely than esophageal cancer. Okay, so bear with, we're almost done. We've got two SBAs left. So for the last 10 minutes now, we're gonna quickly cover hematemesis. Here is your first SBA then, have a read through. Okay, make a note of your answer and we'll bring up your next poll. Get your answers in. Three, two, one. Okay. So let's have a look at what you've gone for. About two thirds going for Mallory Vice and one third going for Pharisees. So the answer here was a Mallory Vice tear. And let's have a look at our last SBA of the day then. And then we'll go over the conditions. So have a read through of this one now. Okay, make a note of your answer and we'll bring up your poll. Get your answers in. Three, two, one. Okay. This one divided a lot more, probably the hardest question, let's say, of the day. Just under half of us going for Burr Harbor syndrome, and that is the answer. For some of you, you may never have heard of that before. If I were to call it a ruptured esophagus, that might make it a bit, might make a bit more sense. 
Um, but Boer Harbor syndrome is a type of ruptured esophagus. So we'll get into these in a minute. Okay, so 10 minutes left. Let's finish things off. Starting with a Mallory Weiss tear, what is this? So it's an eponymous name, doesn't really give much away, but it's a tear in the mucosal layer of the esophagus. Why does this happen? Classically, a Mallory Weiss tear happens after several episodes of vomiting or anything that raises intragastric pressure, pressure inside the stomach. What normally does that? Vomiting. And in an SBA, it will often be after someone has been out binge drinking, so they've been to a sports night, something similar, and then in the morning, they find that they're vomiting, 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 because they're really hungover. And then what happens, the pressure change in the esophagus and all the vomit coming up and up and up eventually leads to a small tear in the mucosal lining, which then bleeds. And then that blood will come up in the vomit as well. Often the bleeds can be quite small, but classically what you're going to see then is a patient is vomiting, 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 and then suddenly they notice that there is some blood streaked within the vomit. So that's classically a Mallory Weiss tear. And then yes, some clues in the question might be a background of binge drinking or possibly bulimia as well. Something that's suggesting that they've been vomiting a lot, maybe food poisoning. How do you diagnose it? Well, you need to see the tear. So you need to do an endoscopy to see that they are bleeding. But it is actually self-limiting. That tear will heal itself. But if it is quite a bad one, if the patient, if the tear is so big that the patient's coming hemodynamically compromised, then you might need to admit them. But majority of the time, it will heal itself. So the main thing you'll want to do is, okay, check it's not anything more serious. But that tear will go back to normal. The patient will be okay. So that's a Mallory Weiss tear. The way I think about it is vomit, 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 blood streaked in the vomit. Whereas the much more serious version of that is something called Burr Harbor syndrome. So that was what our last question was on. Burr Harbor syndrome comes under the heading of an esophageal tear. But what's the difference this time? So we said Mallory Weiss is just a mucosal tear. So just the epithelial layer has torn. This time, the entire esophagus has torn. So you've gone through the whole wall. So how you could think about it, it's like a ruptured esophagus. Like we talked about ruptured ulcers, same sort of idea. You've ruptured the esophagus, there's a hole going all the way through. And like any rupture in your GI tract, you're going to get a very, very sick patient. They're going to be tachycardic. They're probably going to be hypotensive. They're going to feel very clammy. They're going to feel very sick. But what sort of symptoms will they get? So you can imagine that if you perforate all the way through your soft teal wall, you get a lot of pain, you get a lot of pain in your chest. Um, but you'll also vomit up at the same time. And it, just like Mallory Weiss, it can be brought on by vomiting or anything that increases the intragastric pressure. But other things that you actually get as well. So imagine that the esophagus, you break a hole in it. What's gonna happen is all the air in the esophagus is gonna come out. And it's first you're gonna get into the mediastinum. So you're gonna get a pneumomediastinum, and that's what these arrows here are meant to indicate. Could I point that out on a chest x-ray? Probably not. I think it's an unlikely question to get in an exam, but knowing that you get pneumomediastinum is important. The other thing as well that you'll get is a surgical emphysema. So what that means actually is that not only does the air get into the mediastinum, it gets into the skin overlaying the esophagus. And I've never seen it myself, but it sounds pretty nasty. It's basically like bubble wrap, that all of the air comes up underneath your skin cells and you get this kind of crackly, feeling or appearance over that skin. But on top of that, as we said, the patient's probably going to be in shock and they're going to need surgical management. You can't just let that sit there. You're going to need to go in, probably give them antibiotics, but also have a surgeon fix that rupture. And of all the upper GI perforations of, of your ulcers, both duodenal and gastric, this is the one with the highest mortality. So you also hear about something called Mackler's triad, 
Again, eponymous names are horrible. The mapless triad is the classical way it presents with chest pain, pneumomediastinum, and your surgical emphysema. This diagram is pretty nice. It kind of contrasts the two. So Mallory Weiss is, you've got that tear in the mucosa, giving you, an, in essence, an upper GI bleed. But normally, it will be within kind of normal vomit itself. So we say the blood streaked vomit. Whereas Boer Harbor syndrome, you've got these additional signs, the subcutaneous emphysema. You also got a crunching sound when you listen to the heart because of the air surrounding it. And the whole basis behind this is because the esophagus has ruptured entirely, making the patient very, very sick. And you may hear about, you may hear of it referred to as Boer Harbors. You may hear about it referred to as an esophageal rupture. Boer Harbors is a type of esophageal rupture where you've got this sudden increase in the intra-abdominal intra pressure and it's torn through the wall. One that we should mention though, because it's a really important differential to be aware of, are ruptured varices. Now this in itself is now starting to get a lot into hepatology and liver, so I'm not going to go into this in too much depth because we could be here for another half an hour just talking about liver disease. But the idea is when you get cirrhosis, when you get portal hypertension, a lot of the blood, because it can't go through the liver, backs up into all of the venous system around the GI tract. And that would be all the way from the rectum, all the way up to the esophagus, and the, the veins in the esophagus dilate. As they dilate, then they become prone to rupturing. And that's for a few reasons. Number one, all of the alcohol that say those, so anyone with alcohol abuse, generally can end up with cirrhosis over time. But actually ingesting alcohol irritates those veins. So it's kind of, a, there's a lot of danger there that not only does alcohol lead to cirrhosis, which leads to the expanded blood vessels, but the alcohol actually irritates the blood vessels themselves, leaving them prone to rupture. What makes it even worse, if your liver's not working, you don't make clotting factors. And if you don't make clotting factors, then once it bleeds, it really bleeds a lot. So what we often see with esophageal varices is a patient with a background of cirrhosis. And yes, in the UK, that commonly might be a background of alcoholism, but it may be autoimmune, it may be hemochromatosis, maybe lots of other things. So there might be something that points towards liver disease and the idea of a fresh bleed. So this is bright red blood. It's not vomit with blood in, it is bright red blood. And often it's very extreme. You might hear about doctors saying that patients were kind of causing that bad. And obviously as a result, they're probably gonna be in shock. What do you wanna do with the varices? Well, investigations wise, you wanna look for evidence of liver problems. So that might be a raised GGT if there's alcohol abuse, raised bilirubin because normally the liver would break bilirubin down, low albumin because normally the liver would make albumin, and then a macrocytic anemia, because often alcohol abuse will lead to a macrocytic anemia. Urea, that's quite an interesting one. In the chat, does anyone know why you get a raised urea? Any thoughts? Whilst your, yeah, digestive blood. So think what happens if you vomit blood, some of it comes up, some of it goes down and blood is in essence protein. There's a lot of protein in blood. So what happens is that protein then gets back into the vascular supply and all of that protein becomes urea. So when you see a high urea in this kind of patient, then it makes you think, okay, there's been some sort of upper GI bleed. How do you manage them? Well, you need to resuscitate them. So you'll take your A to E approach. In particular, you'll be giving them probably fluids or blood products. Um, and one specifically you give is terlipressin. And what terlipressin does is it brings down portal hypertension. Because if you think you've got all this pressure in those veins, and that's why they're bleeding so much to so bring the pressure down. But the definitive treatment is you need to go in with endoscopy and what you can do is ligate, or you can stick bands over those veins to stop them bleeding. One that we did mention right at the start though, that's under this differential list, ruptured peptic ulcers. So we said if ulcers evade all the way through the wall, eventually they'll rupture. So you probably in this patient, you have a background of peptic ulcer disease. They've had ongoing stomach pains for many months or years. They may have signs of a GI bleeding, 
Melina. And we often call this a coffee ground emesis. So the vomit looks like kind of freeze dry coffee. If you've made one coffee today, you, you probably know what I mean. Um, and why that is, is because the blood, if you're gonna be bleeding here, the, so is ruptured pepticles the same as perforated? No, um, good question. So a ruptured pepticle, sir, is if it goes all the way through the wall and that may bleed or it may not. So a ruptured ulcer is when you go all the way through the wall and as a result, you become very sick. You might get an infection and you need to go in and operate. Now, pepticles, is, however, can bleed without rupturing. And if they bleed, this is when you're going to get those coffee grounds because the blood leaks out into the stomach acids. What does the stomach acid do? It denatures the proteins in the blood and they end up looking like coffee grounds. It's digested blood that they then bring up. So ruptured is when you go through the wall, bleeding is when it bleeds. The two can happen at the same time or they can happen independently of each other. But if it's bleeding quite a lot, you might see a low blood pressure. FBC, okay. If it's just ruptured, if there's no bleeding going on, the FBC can be normal. But if there is some bleeding, you're probably gonna see a microcytic anemia. How do you manage it? We spoke about this earlier. If it's ruptured, you need to operate. If it's bleeding, you go in with an endoscope and you inject adrenaline around the ulcer, which leads to vasoconstriction and stops the bleeding. Following this, then you're gonna give them some sort of PPI to try and lower the stomach acid and protect what's there. And if it comes back that this was all because of H. pylori, you need to treat the H. pylori which at the start we said is triple therapy. So coming back to our questions, don't worry, we're almost done. So in this question, we said Mallory Weiss. Why is that? So we've got this background here of they've been drinking. That's one clue. And they vomited several times. The key thing is that this was normal at first, but afterwards it had fresh blood in. So it's just like we said for Mallory Weiss, normal, 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 blood in, the vomit. The other clue then is their heart rate's fine and their blood pressure is fine as well. I know if, especially if in your early years you, that may not might, might not be that obvious. I would suggest learning the normal values for heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate etc because those are the sort of stuff that in an emergency setting you just can't look up you need to know it or not. So this is a normal blood pressure and a normal heart rate. That rules out things like Oh, anything that's ruptured, because if this was ruptured, patients would be much more sick. How do you tell if it's ruptured? So generally, if it's ruptured, just like I said, they're going to be hemodynamically compromised. Now, I know that's confusing because they might be hemodynamically compromised because they've lost blood. But generally, if something's ruptured, you're going to see air into the diaphragm. We spoke about that at the start. If it's a peptic ulcer and they're going to be very, very sick. Um, how can you tell as OGD is contraindicated? So I wouldn't say an OGD is contraindicated here in these patients. Um, maybe if it's ruptured. So the clue, generally speaking, will be you'll do a chest x-ray and that will help give it away. Or I imagine if you're especially unsure, you might do a CT. Um, I hope this is not getting too confusing now. Let's come back to that. But just looking at this question, Mallory Weiss, because they're hemodynamically fine. They've had vomit, 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 completely normal, and then blood in the vomit on the background, probably of a binge. Last question. So what we've now got is someone who's vomited blood. So it's not blood in vomit, it's actual blood. But the fact they've had food poisoning for several days, that points towards they've had a background of vomiting. So they've been vomiting a lot. And it doesn't tell you anywhere that the blood was, the vomit was normal, if the vomit was normal first, um, then we would think Mallory Weiss. But the fact that it started with blood may, means that Mallory Weiss is very unlikely. Obviously looking at the options in MI, you would not vomit blood with an MI. As for ruptured varices, yes, you would probably have fresh blood but there's nothing here to suggest that this patient has a background of liver disease. So there's nothing to suggest that they probably have varices. But looking at this, okay, they're tachycardic, they're hypotensive, so they're hemodynamically compromised. 
and they've got this severe chest pain, they've vomited blood, and then they've mentioned that surgical emphysema, the crackling sound, but also the pneumomediastinum. So they've got the air coming out of the esophagus into the mediastinum, and that's why we're going for Boer Harbor. It's not varices, because although varices, yes, would give you fresh blood, and they would make you hemodynamically compromised, they wouldn't give you the other symptoms in the list. So we've been through a lot today. I know that was quite heavy for an hour and a half. Hopefully, however, that was helpful. Just to quickly summarize then, we've been over three key presentations. Dyspepsia, so your kind of early satiety, your abdominal discomfort, we've got dysphagia, hematemesis. What conditions have we been through? So we've been through peptic ulcer disease within which we've talked about H. pylori. We talked about gastric cancer, which can be a potential complication. We talked about gourd, and gourd can happen because of a hiatus hernia. Gourd can then lead to Barrett's esophagus, which can lead to esophageal cancer. We've spoken about achalasia, Mallory Weiss. So we said that's where you get a tear in the mucosa of the esophagus and then esophageal cancer as well. Some take home messages on the screen. I won't bother reading them out, just in the interest of time, and I'll probably make a start answering some of your questions. So one person, so yeah, a little bit of confusion here. Um, in an emergent situation, if you're suspecting peptic ulcer bleeding perforation, would you always do a chest x-ray? So if you have a patient coming into a and &E, often they will get, if they're sick, they'll go and get a chest x-ray done. If they're very sick, they'll bring the chest x-ray to them. And if there is any sort of perforation, so peptic ulcers perforated, then hopefully the chest x-ray will pick that up. Now, if they're really, really unwell and you seriously suspect that there is some bleeding going on, then you might proceed straight to endoscopy. But I would say generally that they're gonna go for an x-ray first because it's much less invasive, yet it's much cheaper, and it will hopefully guide what you do first. Often if the patient is well enough, we'd want an erect chest x-ray so they can stand up so all the air can come to the top. So to answer that question, if you're suspecting peptic ulcer disease, um, sorry, a perforated peptic ulcer, get your chest x-ray and hopefully that will confirm what you think. Um, similar to a perforated peptic ulcer, um, can a ruptured peptic ulcer cause pneumoperitoneum? So yes, yeah, so you may have missed what we had earlier, the chest x-ray at the start. So pneumoperitoneum means air in the peritoneum. And that generally points towards a perforation along the GI tract, anywhere below the diaphragm. So anywhere that any part of GI tract that gives you, um, in the meantime, if you want to please fill in the feedback, any part of the GI tract where if air leaks out, it will leak out into the diaphragm. So that could be ulcers in the stomach, in the duodenum. It could be that you've had an obstruction that has perforated. It could be that you've got some sort of infection that has perforated. Um, so on your point there, neuroperitoneum points towards a perforation anywhere in the GI tract from the, from the stomach downwards. If it was the esophagus, then you would get air in the mediastinum because that's what's surrounding the esophagus. Um, I think the wrong name is on the feedback form. Um, hmm, so there's a link just above that you can click on that should be able to give you access there. If not, we'll be putting out through our social media. Um, some of the other questions, so someone's mentioned, yep, so the link I gave you to the MedEd resources, the Imperial ones, all the stuff on social media, you can access very easily. Um, some of the older resources on that website do have password protection. Um, the majority of them do not. So if you look at the stuff for final years, which is very applicable to any area of general medicine, all of that has no password protection. The stuff that is aimed at third years, which I imagine quite a lot of you are, we're in the process of actually putting on all of this year's info and the vast majority of that does not have password protection. So if anything on that website has password protection, probably the reason is because it's quite outdated and therefore you do wanna look at it. All of the newer, more up-to-date stuff will not have passwords there. So I'd say if you come up with anything with a password, probably the reason is because they don't want you to look at it because it's probably a little bit old now. Um, a few other things to talk about. So there's quite a few questions here. So a question about that MedEd link, great, we've answered that. 
what's the difference between reflux and regurgitation? So reflux is the stomach acids or the stomach contents coming up. Regurgitation is if it goes all the way back up into the mouth. So that's your difference. Reflux, okay, it comes up partially, but if it goes all the way to the mouth, that's regurgitation. What part of the stomach herniates in a rolling versus sliding hernia? Um, to be honest, I don't know. In both, it's the top part. The main difference is just the way in which it herniates. Um, so it's the problem is either is it the hiatus, the part next to the esophagus, does that herniate, or is it the part right next to it? When I send out the slides, have a look back at the diagram. And under the diagram, I'll have more info on the notes. It's not too important of a point. What's the difference between rolling and sliding? Um, the key thing to know is they predispose you to gourd. Um, but the idea is it's generally the same area, the top part of the stomach, but they are slightly different. Have a look on the slides. Um, so people have mentioned about the OneDrive on the meta thing. Again, I'll have a look into that. We'll see if we can, if there's any ways if anything you can't access, we'll see how we can make it more accessible. Um, when would you give a H1 antagonist as opposed to a PPI? So generally they go for PPI first, um, but let's say either they're allergic, they don't tolerate it well, or it just doesn't work, then you might go to an H1 antagonist, things like brunitidine. But most often we start with things like omeprazole and lansoprazole. Um, that question about scleroderma. So why does limited scleroderma give you these esophageal symptoms? I know that's very confusing. So broadly speaking for all of you, there are two types of scleroderma, limited and diffuse. Now limited, some people think about it as, oh, it's limited to the skin. Actually, what you find with limited scleroderma is, yes, it does have a lot of skin symptoms, calcinosis, Raynaud's, um, tan tangelactasia, bit of a mouthful, um, but it does give you the soft yield dysmotility. The difference with diffuse, so diffuse doesn't just mean, oh, it doesn't, it affects more than the skin. What diffuse normally points towards is that it affects the trunk. I know that's confusing because the esophagus is in the trunk, but diffuse scleroderma often is a lot more severe and it will affect the um, different organs than limited. So take, for example, um, the lungs. You can get um, fibrosis of your lungs. That's much more common in diffuse. The idea, I, how I remember diffuse, firstly, the, or, the antibodies are a bit different. I couldn't quote you on them right now. Don't remember off the top of my head. Um, so number one, the antibodies are different. Number two, diffuse often occurs a bit more quickly. It's a bit more severe and it targets the internal organs. That's what we think about more as diffuse. So things like the lungs, et cetera. Um, whereas limited, great, someone's posted the antibodies, thank you very much. Um, but yeah, limited, you're thinking more the skin, but you still can get your soft yield dysmotility. Um, would first line investigation for dysphagia always be barium swallow? I'm not too sure of the specifics on that. Um, I would imagine yes. So you think about manometry, um, to measure the pressure around that sphincter, I imagine it's gonna be fairly invasive. So it's probably a lot easier for them to do a barium swallow. Yes, there is a little bit of radiation with a barium swallow, but you do hear about them a lot more commonly. So yes, that's probably gonna be first line. Don't quote me on it though. Why do you get esophagitis with bisphosphonates? Um, bisphosphonates I've heard are quite large tablets and they get stuck on the way down. And so what they actually do is they hit the side of the esophagus and maybe a little bit breaks off. It sticks to the esophagus and the actual substance itself is very, very damaging to the lining of the esophagus. So the advice you give to patients who are taking bisphosphonates, we spoke about earlier, they take them once a week in the morning and before breakfast, and they're told to stand up for 30 minutes when they take it. And that's to stop any of that bisphosphonate hitting the esophagus. Um, how does an empty stomach and standing help along alandronic acid? Um, hopefully I've just answered that question now. Um, because you're stood up, it's the idea of gravity. Whereas if you lie down, it's a bit like we said with gourd earlier, the gastric acid's gonna go back. What are you looking for in the stool test for H. pylori? H. pylori antigens. So some specific 
molecular marker on the surface of the H. pylori that they've probably identified. Um, and then they can look for it in the stool. And if it's in the stool, it means you have H. pylori. A um, couple of people asked that one. Why is it Virco's lymph node is always involved with pathology? Um, so my understanding of that is that Virco's node is the first lymph node that a lot of the GI system drains to. Um, so a lot of the GI system drains up into your left supraclavicular fossa. So if you're going to have metastasis, that's the first place it's going to go. So that's often why you hear about Virco's nodes with any of these GI cancers. Um, can you differentiate reflux and esophagitis without imaging? Not really, no. Because esophagitis and inflamed esophagus, you need to see that inflammation. Would you treat the two differently? So esophagitis from gourd, no. If it's from gourd, you treat the gourd like you would treat reflux from gourd. Um, but if it's esophagitis that's now leading to um, dysplasia, as we said earlier, you might need to cut that out or you might need to give them some radiofrequency ablation. Do you always do barium and swallow before manometry? So someone kind of asked that question earlier. My understanding is probably because it's less invasive. Um, any good resources for SBA slash clinical years? So as I said, I think a good book, if you have not read it, is Oxford Cases in Medicine and Surgery. Definitely read that. Really good book. Um, if you read it a year ago, reread it. It's not only really good for your written exams, it's got some example questions in. When you do eventually have an OSCE, really, really good for OSCEs. Um, there's not many other books I'd probably recommend apart from that. That's the main one I'd say is worth looking into. Um, SBAs, so Becoming a Doctor is currently working on producing a free online question bank. Um, that is a bit of a while away, but do keep your eyes peeled for that one. Um, yes, I've mentioned the MedEd resource. Um, some of those resources you will be able to access immediately right now. Have a look in the year six folder is probably the best thing to do. Um, but some of the stuff aimed at year threes, um, yes, you might need a little bit of help accessing those. I'll see what I can do. Um, are there any questions I didn't get through? How did you revise for SBAs? Um, so my guidance with SBAs, um, a lot of people think that they need to do all their revision before starting SBAs. Don't. Because often by the time you finish your revision, you've not got many days left until your exam. I would say do SBA straight away. So mix up SBAs and um, actual kind of book work on going through notes. Um, so how I generally would structure revision is say every, if I was studying for most of the day, I might do half an hour or an hour of SBAs. I'd go over them if it was a book or if it was something like past med, um, I would obviously have gone through them whilst I was doing them. And then that would give me a good idea of what topics I know well and what topics I don't know well. And then I might take a quick break and then I'd come back and I'd revise those relevant conditions for the next hour or so. And then I'd just repeat that process. Um, so that's generally why I'd suggest with SBAs, that SBAs are a good way to test your knowledge, but they're also a good way to show you what you do and don't know. And they're actually a really good way just to learn information in the first place. Um, so definitely don't wait too long to start on SBAs thread them throughout your practice. Um, I think that's all of our questions. On the topic of do you do a barium swallow before any OGD, um, as I said earlier, if you suspect a pharyngeal pouch, you need to do a barium swallow because you don't want to perforate the, the pharyngeal pouch. However, if this is a normal endoscopy and they have nothing to suggest a pharyngeal pouch, my understanding is it is fine to go straight through to endoscopy. Um, because again, imagine an emergency situation with varices, no way are you going to be doing a barium swallow first. You're going to send them straight off for endoscopy. Um, we've spoken about scleroderma. Hopefully my explanation was okay. I know I'm not the best rheumatology. Um, yes, you probably want to do barium swallow first. What was the book you suggested reading for clinical medicine? Oxford Cases in Medicine and Surgery. It has a red cover. Oxford Cases in Medicine and Surgery. Um, What would suggest a pouch? Um, the food getting stuck high up. So the food journey wouldn't get down to the bottom because the pharynx is fairly high up in the esophagus. Um, so that would generally point towards a pharyngeal pouch, the idea that the food is high up when it gets stuck. And yes, as you mentioned, the halitosis, the bad breath. So I think that is all of your questions. Um, I'll hang around for one or two minutes if you're finished, but otherwise, 
Thank you for tuning in. I know we've just been taking questions for like 15 minutes there. Um, so thanks for giving up nearly two hours of your Monday night. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, I believe that was my final lecture for becoming a doctor. Um, so hopefully you like that. Over the next few weeks, these slides will be going out. As I said, do check out our website, log on to the portal, set yourself up, and you can look over all of the slides from the last three weeks. I did one a while back on the kidney and the lungs, so you can have a look over that, but there's loads and loads for you to have a look through with lots of SBAs to try out as well. Um, so let's call it a day there. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and best of luck to you all with your exams. Thank you very much.